26. Rose-colored night, sailors take fright. The problem is where to go, said Ilaria, standing over Skeleton, rolled in the rug, a single arm free. The skeleton reached for the strange map. Ilaria was still looking at it and had been looking at it ever since the boat stopped. I'm using the map at the moment, Skeleton. Thank you for your patience. Our problem is that the boat won't move anymore, said Naro, sitting down cross-legged on the deck. Now that they had escaped, Naros didn't much care if the boat moved or not. Still, boats should move, especially flying boats. It's disconcerting to just be sitting still in the sky. Not moving seems to be the first step in falling, and that's why Naros had begun reading in earnest. If they were to be sky pirates, they'd need a magical safety net. The boat floated in midair, swaying lightly with the breeze. A glance down told them that they were in the same spot, a child waved from the hill. To him it looked like tiny people on a two-person sailing craft. To him it looked like miniature people on a two-person sailing craft, the kind he'd learned on. He ran back down the hill to tell his father that the fairies had taken one of their black training ships and moored it in the sky. Boat no move in water. Now no move in air. Not a boat. A house! Chagall punched the side of the boat hard. The top of it cracked and a large chunk about the size of a fist broke off. From her high perch... At the end of the mast, Rose squealed in pain. A drip of yellow blood fell from her arm. Lyre threw the top corner of the metallic sail down to Triton. The sail unfolded from within the hollow mast in a beautiful cascade of interwoven silver triangles that caught and reflected the orange afternoon light. Triton caught the end as he pulled himself out of the tackle box. Ouch, he called. The steel rope cut Triton's hands. The blood marked the tip of the sail. Everything on the ship was awkward. Even the latches on the tackle boxes, as if made for much larger hands. Three times larger. Triton finally managed to hook the sail through the metal ring at the end of the boom pole. He had to stand on Chagall's shoulders to reach it. At least the boom won't knock us in the head when it sweeps from side to side. Now we'll be sailing, Triton Kostna said proudly. Sky pirates! The horizon had rolled away from the sun and dyed the sky a beautiful pink. I figured it out. Help me bail this overboard, said Triton, grabbing the helmet off the shorter dwarf Murdoch's head. We're too heavy. The water must go. Out of the tackle boxes, over the side. Quick! All hands. Oh, what fool tries to fill a boat with water, grumbled Rupert, the taller and younger dwarf as he complied. Grumbled Rupert, the taller and younger dwarf as he complied. Murdoch, his father, simply crossed his arms. His frown deepened, if that was possible. Since his son had not taken offense to his helmet being yanked off his head, there was nothing Murdoch could do. But, oh, he wanted Triton to try taking his own helmet. They may be mercenaries, but no money could buy Murdoch's pride. His nose turned a kind of angry orange. Stone boat, metal sail, an imp who throws fire, a skeleton who is immune to fire, Nothing else aboard but tackle boxes full of water, said Triton, puzzling it out. Suddenly, he stopped shoveling water and looked up at Ilaria. She carefully folded the map and inserted it back into the bone scroll tube. I think I've figured out 
where we need to go. Wait, don't put away the map, said Triton quickly. It can catch fire. It's the only flammable thing aboard besides us. The only thing Rose values. What, what does Rose want? Don't worry, Triton. I've got it all up here. Ilaria patted her head. Besides, there's a breeze. We wouldn't want it to blow away. Ilaria took the bone cap attached to the scroll tube with a thin metal chain and screwed it on. Hold your breath! Triton dropped Murdoch's helmet full of water over the side of the boat. It fell straight down, but before it hit the ground, Triton was a blur of action. As the irate dwarf lunged for his son's twice-forged and five-times-folded helm, the turquoise seaman shoved Murdoch into the open compartment of water. With his other hand, he pulled Rupert into the adjoining box of water. He kicked the mage Gnarls' spellbook off the side of the boat and shouted, Fireball! Then wrapped both arms around Ilaria and dove into the remaining tackle box of water. Rose appeared, hovering, right before her fireball blossomed. A huge grin on her face. Gnarls had one moment to loop a rope around his waist and leap overboard. As the rope uncoiled, Chagall grabbed the far end, looped it around his waist, and ran. Each jumped off opposite sides of the boat. Fire chased after them as it leaped out in every direction from the center of the boat. In the moment before the fire, there was only Skeleton left standing on the deck, one arm protruding, wrapped in a tightly bound, luxuriously thick carpet. The others were overboard, or in what they now realized were fire safety hatches. Except for Lyre, who had curled up into the crow's nest, her cloak wrapped around her. Flames licked Lyre's boots and broke onto her back. Fire cascaded over the open hatches, steaming away the first inch of water. Fire caught the rope, holding Gnarls and Chagall, that hung taut across the midship. It sent the carpet, containing Skeleton, up in a cone of flame. Lyre threw her burning cloak down to the deck. No, uh, indeed you won't be their leader now, Tor Grieve Silverstream, because you have nothing to lead. The imp buzzed toward Lyre, across the water compartments, closing one after another with a kick of her foot. She grabbed the rope in the center of the ship, and a retractable claw popped out of her wrist. As she swung down towards the rope, her blow was deflected by a silver monogrammed knife as if from nowhere. Unnoticed, Edmund, half-burnt and maniacal, slashed up once and then twice. Rose reeled back, her arm and leg dripping a trail of sulfurous blood. The ship creaked and moaned, two great cracks appearing in the hull. Ah! cried the smoldering and staggering Edmund. He'd marked the imp from the first moment they set on the boat when she'd still been a statue. When she'd disappeared on Lyre, he had tracked her. Masked by magic, Rose still made noise, still took up space, still cast a shadow. He had seen her shadow, like a gargoyle on the top of the mast, playing across the rocks on the shore, and then, as the sun moved over the ripe fields and over the cut, he had heard her whispers to Lyre, though he couldn't understand them. He didn't speak that language. He had missed her quiet descent next to the mast, but then had picked up her raspy breath as she passed by him, where he stood at that time next to the mast, and then he'd moved and followed her on soft, slippered feet. Sitting behind her in the prow of the boat, flattening himself when the fire bloomed, Rose had not bothered to remove herself from the wrath of the flame. In fact, the fireball was about the size of the boat itself. There was nowhere to go. She was immune. This was something that Edmund had not taken into account. He pried open the aquabock latches with his trembling fingers. 
First one dwarf, then the other, burst the surface gasping, their wet beards shrunken against their faces, revealing them for the shrewish mammals that we all are when crawling out of holes and dark places. Edmund flipped the last latch and, without waiting to see if he'd gotten there in time, turned to the rope. He rested his silver blade against the taut line. It was thinner than it had been before. Fire gnawed at it. Edmund considered the people on either side of the rope, a barbarian on one, a wizard on the other. Helpful, but also threatening. They might survive a fall. He was curious to see if they would. Why didn't I let Rose cut the cord? Why save some and destroy others? Edmund smiled at his questions. Because that is my game. A light, cool hand rested itself on Edmund's shoulder. Then a heavy wave of water crashed over him. He fell to his knees. You were burning, Edmund. I created some water. Over your head, Ilaria explained. You can do that all the time? Asked Triton, his head poking out of the water box, gasping for breath. I used to make farms in the desert, replied Ilaria. That's what I went to school for. A disembodied hand laid an arrow-pierced book on the deck of the ship. The book floated against the rail, sloshing in an inch of water. Then Narls threw an arm and a leg over the edge and pulled himself aboard. The rope on his waist pulled him halfway across the deck and then snapped. But it did not fall. Skeleton snatched the squiggling rope before it could leap over the side. The skeleton stood there impassively, straight up, seven feet tall at least. Human, but something more. There was an extra rib, like elves have, but broader boned, bigger than elven skeletons, and human, and orc. Bigger than any of the skeletons Edmund had examined in his great-great-great-uncle's museum of natural humanoid forms. The disconcerting thick tongue inside Skeleton's mouth crept out for a moment to taste the air. The ship lurched, and Ilaria lost her feet. Tumbling among Skeleton's ankles as the skeleton pulled the rope, winding the slack around its leg until finally it brought Chagall into the boat. The barbarian dripped with broken tomatoes. Apparently, the onlookers below attire of this spectacle in the sky, joked Narls. Chagall found Narls's eye, and the two gave one another a casual nod, masking the flash of intense concern that each had for the other. I knew it would work, said Narls. Chagall shrugged. He walked over to the rope's end that Narls was retying together and threw one half overboard. Then he looped the frayed end around Narls's waist. That was more like the proper length. Chagall had hit the ground. The rope on his side was too long. Still, it wasn't too bad of a fall. A cart of tomatoes had helped to break it. Edmund was now nowhere to be seen. Ilaria could heal his burns if he'd show himself. The boat was only so big, and yet somehow this wily nobleman managed to keep himself completely secret. Maybe he was tracking the imp again, looking for a spot of yellow blood to give away her hiding place. Ilaria had a bump on her head. She closed her eyes and lay down on the deck. Water dripped from her body. The spikes of her hair relaxed into the shiny bottom of the boat. No wonder it is so slippery. No wonder it is airtight, thought Ilaria. This is not the first time the boat has been fired. The bottom is smooth as fire glass. She rested her cheek there for a moment. It was warm. The paint on the bottom had burnt off, 
and through a thick curve of fire glass she could see the ground below. A tomato arched up in the air, reached its apogee just out of reach of the bottom of the boat. It tumbled back to the ground, landing on the head of the teenager who had shot it from a slingshot. Ah, the carefree days of delinquency.